interviewing Julie Cullivan here, who is the CIO and EVP Business Operations of uh, FireEye. Thank you so much for Hello. coming. Hello. Happy to be here. Very good. Why don't we start with uh, just a brief introduction of uh, yourself and, uh, and FireEye for the audience. Um, we've got, we've got uh, quite a few uh, security folks here, but we also have people who um, are not in security, so it'd be okay. good. Um, so I've been in technology for a long time. I've worked at two different uh, security companies. First one was McAfee Intel Security, now soon to be McAfee again. Um, and then I've been at FireEye for the last almost four years. I joined about nine months before we went public and um, initially came in as the CIO as part of that role focused on building out a security program for FireEye. Uh, and then I took on some additional responsibilities over time. So I think we've got a security background, but also have the you have to come sell to me background that might be of use to some of the folks in this room. Very good, and we do have uh, we we do have some startups in the room, um, so let's uh, let's start talking a little bit about the cybersecurity market uh, in general, and then we'll hone on to some uh, specific um, issues. So one of the hot topics uh, of the last few months has been the um, the bubbly uh, market, or um, let, let, let's say maybe we're uh, on the on the other side of the um, of the hill or, or of the peak. Uh, of the cybersecurity market. So we've seen declining valuations from seed uh, through to public companies. Uh, we've seen uh, and experienced uh, VCs who are less um, interested in investing in cybersecurity companies. It's, it's taken longer to raise money at every stage in the process. What's, what's your view in terms of uh, what's going on? Well, I mean, I think that the, what you describe is very real. Um, it was a very, very hot markup. Uh, market. There was a lot of early investments, um, and I think what's ended up uh, to, to happen is that there's been more of a realization that um, technology alone isn't going to solve the security problem for most enterprises, and that there's um, other services that need to be offered to complement kind of what's going on. I also think that there were a lot of companies that had some fantastic technology and capabilities, but they were almost more of a feature than a full product that then could grow and innovate from there. So um, I, I think it's, it, we see these in a lot of markets. There was a lot of copycat type, you know, companies trying to start up that all did vaguely the same thing, but not exactly the same thing, so. So that's actually the, the next question is, um, it's, it seems like um, e even now on, on, on this side of the, of the peak, maybe off peak, uh, we're still seeing, so many security startups that seem to be either doing the same thing or, you know, well, either little differentiation or, or solving problems that are just uh, too small to care. Um, what, what, what do you think in terms of, you know, startups and, and, and innovation? Is there too much? Um, what, well, what I would thoughts? never say there's too much innovation. Um, you know, I, I think that... Uh, a lot of people came up with similar ideas at the same time with slightly different approaches for how to solve the problem. I, again, I come from a security company, but you know, if I look at some of the other parts of the security space, like cloud access brokers and these types of things, all of a sudden there were 60 of them. And they were all at RSA and they were all you know, talking about what they did and they all had a very different approach to um, kind of what it meant to them. Um, and also, for example, not a lot of them actually prevented anything. It was just more like, hey, here's more information, more of this information that you guys were just talking about in the last session. So, um, I mean, I think it's that the company's got to have a broader vision than that one piece of the, they have to know where they want to go from there, even if, if that's going to be their foot in the door. Yeah, uh, and so can you point out at some specific interesting areas? Uh, you, you mentioned CASB, um, but that's that's been around for yeah. a couple three years now. What what are some um, as you as you as you look at on the on you know the landscape of startups and innovation areas? What what are some of the hot topics, hot areas? Well, I mean, I think that um, more and more, and I get to spend time talking to customers, not just you know focused internally that. Um, a lot of companies have made huge investments in security, yet they still are facing a lot of challenges. And a lot more of those challenges are the operational challenges, right? So how do I ingest all this information? How do I correlate things across the different technologies I've invested in? So I see that, that companies are looking for things that are gonna really help from a workflow, orchestration, automation, and they really need to be presenting 
investments to their executive team that come with some sort of ROI back. Not an insurance policy, not a, hey, this is gonna protect us, but this is actually gonna bring additional value to the organization. Um, to your point, you can't hire enough people in this space. Um, and so, you know, companies are looking for ways to be able to, um, you know, hey, automate remediation wherever they can, um, eliminate sort of the swivel chair workflows that go on, and figure out ways to tie the various in, uh, security investments together, right? And, and some would argue that SIMs themselves didn't work, right? I think we even heard that in the last session. They solved part of the problem, but not the whole problem. So um, that's what I think, and that, that's more coming from a, a, a CIO perspective than a FireEye perspective. Yeah, and certainly, I mean, we can point to your uh, Infotas um, acquisition yeah. as... Um, and that was not a plug for Infotas. <laughs> as, as automating uh, workflow. Yeah. Uh, we also have a portfolio company like that called Hexaday that mm -hmm. also does this sort of thing. So we're uh, very much on the same page. And then I think you were you, you saw the panel earlier that I was on that, that was um, about AI yep. and using AI to, you know, to reduce the human work workload. And so, you know, all, yep. all that stuff is really, really interesting. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we had this um, massive uh, DDoS um, attack on uh, on DIN. Is it DIN or DINE? How do you how do you pronounce it? I think DIN. The, uh, the However you want to say it's the, fine the, with the, me. The, 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 uh, frankly, a small company that, 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 that was given a lot of responsibility uh, in the internet as, um, you know, this, this, this switchboard. Um, yeah. And uh, that brought down Twitter, GitHub, Spotify, a bunch of others. Um, how when when you when you read about that, you know what was going through your your mind? How, how do you view that attack? Um, how is it even possible? And then you know what are some opportunities for entrepreneurs around that? Well, I mean, you know, certainly, um, you know, it goes back to IoT, right? And there's all these devices now talking to the internet. People don't even realize. I I think of my Fitbit every time um, when when th this example comes up. So. I mean, what's so interesting about that particular, you know, um, episode is that so much of it goes back to people not changing a password and leaving the default password for the technology in place. And again, I, you know, people talk about it as if it was a vulnerability when really it was just human error in many ways. And I think that's what's most scary about this whole security space. It's there's still humans involved in all these activities that are going on and that not everybody understands the importance of security or the role they play in security. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges, right, is that accidental insider threat, that human threat that, you know, is difficult to um, completely control. So that one I found interesting just because that what, from what I read as they really dug into it, it comes back to never change the password. So it wasn't that they found a vulnerability. It was we just use the machine factory password and in, in, into all those devices. So. so let me bring that up for just a second. Username password. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's astonishing. I mean, we've had username passwords for as long as computers have been around. So what, almost a century or something. Uh, we're we're still using them uh, every day. We're keying in a, a username and a password. Um, what what percentage of of hacking activity um, involves um, you know the compromise of a username password and and how come in 2016 going into 2017 we're still we still have this problem? Well, I mean, I think that I don't know the exact percentage, but I believe that most of the big breaches that happened over the last, you know, five years, that, that a very high percentage, when they look back, it started with some sort of email spear phishing attack that involves somebody then putting in their credentials, um, and that those bad actors were very smart about who were they, they were targeting because they were getting credentials from people that had a lot of access. Um, so, I mean, I think it, it, it has been the source of many of the biggest breaches that have happened. And again, I think it comes back to this human element, right, that um, security awareness, all the, you know, techniques that all companies are trying to use, right, to educate employees, it only takes one wrong click and putting in, it's fascinating when they talk about these different studies and tests that companies do, well, they'll actually train everybody on how to identify a bad email, 
um, you know, all the things to look for. People will go through the training and then they will send them an email and those are the same people. Like it's the, the same percentage click before the training is after the training. So I think I, this goes back to sort of everyone having a lot more personal awareness about your own security, right? Not just the company you work for, but your own security. So I find this whole thing fascinating because I see people willing to put stuff on Facebook or whatever, yet then they're really worried about, hey, what are you doing with my data? I'm like, um, I think people could figure out how to, you know, how to, um, you know, cause a problem for you without you needing to worry about what I'm doing with your mobile data or whatever it is. So it's kind of an interesting how people look at their work life and their personal life very different when it comes to this area. Okay, I'm being told that we have only five minutes. So, right, five minutes left. Okay, right. so I'm going to try to pick on uh, just a couple topics okay. here. Uh, we have seven. Okay, <laughs> so three topics here. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about Israel, entrepreneurship, cybersecurity. Um, I've interviewed your, uh, your colleague, Ken Gonzalez, yep. who came to Israel and saw a lot of startups. Um, Tell, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how you and or FireEye view the Israeli cybersecurity scene and, like, what are the opportunities there? Talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, I think that um, the Israeli scene is considered a, a great source of amazing entrepreneurs, very pr focused on security, right? And a lot of that is because of the, you know, the military background folks have, the intelligence there, and, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of super smart people there you know, with great ideas, putting together um, companies. I, FireEye has, has um, not specifically acquired any, any technology or companies from Israel as of yet, but when I was at McAfee, there was uh, several companies that were acquired that came in through that. Um, so, I mean, I think there's absolute recognition. It is a source of, of amazing, you know, skills, capabilities, entrepreneurship to bring great security solutions to the market. And some advice to startups that are sitting in the audience. Um, so you, you, like you said in your in your uh, opening sentence, I mean, you've been you've been at Autodesk, McAfee, EMC, Oracle. You've seen enterprise sales from all directions. You've been CIO for a long time. Um, what what are some uh, what's some advice for Israeli entrepreneurs that are trying to penetrate, trying to sell uh, sell into large organizations? What what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it really fundamentally is a, is solve a problem. Um, a real problem that, that's there. And if you can solve a problem that there's a very um, real way of showing what the value or benefit back is, that that, that helps. Um, I also it really, when I have companies come in to talk about what it is that they're doing, I, you know, listen more than you talk, right? Listen to what people are saying, because I think then that is going to really help you to be able to identify whether they're a true opportunity or not. So I see, and again, this is not Israeli companies, it's a lot of small startups that'll come in to talk to us about what it is that they have to do, and they're doing all the talking. And I think when you do a little more listening, you actually learn more, and you might identify right away, hey, this isn't the right model for what it is that we do. Um, and that's what we spend a lot of time at FireEye working with our sales organization on is, <laughs> listen, <laughs> before you start solutioning. Um, so that would be my simple advice. Okay, a bit more on FireEye then. Uh, let's talk a little bit about M&A and Corp Dev at, at FireEye, which mm -hmm. I, I know you, all, you also know a lot about. Um, you know, you guys are considering buying startups every now and then, small, large, medium. How, how do you go about these kind of uh, decisions, build versus buy, you know, how mm -hmm. big to buy outside? Et cetera. Yep. Um, again, this is not my area of expertise per se. I mean, Ken, my counterpart, um, I've worked at a couple of companies with him, and um, he, he's much more the expert. But I mean, you know, we're, we look at three choices, right? It's, it's build, it's buy, but it's also partner, right? So a lot of times, maybe a partnership is the better route, and it's not always that you need to buy the technology or build it yourself. And, and the way we sort of try to look at that is, you know, how core is it to what we do versus how adjacent or complementary is it to what we do and sort of use those factors. Now, once we've decided, hey, this is core to who we wanna be and, and the problems we wanna solve for customers, then it really becomes a decision of, is there something that exists out there that we can buy and easily integrate and build into our roadmap? Um, or is it something that, hey, 
you know, it's not that hard to build. It's not going to cost us that much. It's not going to take us too long. So, I mean, we're always kind of looking at first is, is there something already out there? Um, but then it's really a question of, hey, can we build it ourselves without having to make a huge investment or take, you know, too long of a time to be able to get it to market? So. And you've, you've built the company on, uh, at least recently, on some really interesting uh, acquisitions. Um, so Eyesight Partners, um, Mandiant was the, the big one. Um, we, we mentioned Invotas. Um, so how, how, what's it been like integrating these acquisitions and how are you uh, leveraging them for, you know, yeah. for the fire eye brand? So from a, a, a message in the market, I mean, I think all of them were very complementary to what we were trying to do. I think Mandiant was probably the biggest surprise, right, because here we were really taking a technology company and a services organization with some product and, and some, some interesting technology and bringing those together. But I think that goes to our story about, you know, prevent and detect is, is, is really important, but it's really being able to respond um, and having the right response plan that, that you have to have as well. So um, from a messaging perspective, not super complicated. Certainly from a CIO's perspective in terms of taking a services organization and folding it into a product company or um, taking as a service businesses. And, and you know, FireEye really originally was very much an appliance sort of hardware type story. Morphing those, right, so that we could become more of an as a service company has been has been complex, but, but um, we're, we're, we're you know, doing well and headed in that direction and have more and more cloud and as a service type offerings. Fascinating. Maybe, maybe Talia will allow for one question from the audience. Maybe one question. Does anybody have a question to ask? Yeah. In the last session, you talked about AI and how AI is sort of a new, uh, sort of trying to mimic humans. You just talked about humans being a big source of actual security. <laughs> maybe we don't want to mimic them. Yeah. Well, I, no, I'm, I'm wondering, will AI ever help us humans? You know, I would hope, I, I will be the first to admit I am no AI expert. Um, I mean, I would hope, right? I mean, the idea is so that less and less you have to rely on a human, right? So I would like to believe that. Um, but I would be getting way out of my realm in terms of, of you know, sort of innovation or AI expertise. So, Please uh, join me in thanking Julie Kaufman. <laughs>